welcome to Haunted Hospitality, Southern Stories Told by Spooky Gingers. I'm Robin. And I'm Zoe. All right. And I, <laughs> and I have a story for you today, but first, Zoe, how's life? Well, um, life is good. I'm sore today because I showed up to my sparring class yesterday and I was the only one to show up beyond the coach and the coach's son. So you just punched yourself a lot? No, he actually taught me kickboxing. Mm. Yeah, so he had me do the one-two punch, if you will, but, like, I had... I do love a good one-two punch. I know, right? And he was teaching me, like, different combos, and my shin specifically is very sore because I was having to do a lot of, like, kicks, like, roundhouse kicks. Mm -hmm. I know what that is. It's basically... So it's my back leg, (laughs) Uh and I'm essentially... I'm sorry, you have a back leg? So, Robin... (laughs) Ooh, guys, she's getting up. I'm go- I'm standing like this, right? Okay. I don't know if the mics can hear She me. is standing like she's going to beat me up. <laughs> so this is a one. She punched something and said this is a one. This is a two. She punched something else and said this is a two. And this is a roundhouse kick. And her leg went insane. <laughs> <laughs> so I was kicking my coach. I mean, he had a um, protective bag. No, I just think you were just beating the crap out of him. (laughs) I do that normally on Fridays, yes. But because we're sparring and he doesn't know how to protect his head. so I mean, he does know. He just doesn't because he... Is this Gene we're talking about? Yes. Gene! (laughs) He he totally knows how to protect his head. It's just um, he goes easy on me because I'm still learning. And by going easy, you mean, okay, fine, you can have up my head. (laughs) Yeah, essentially. But um, so, yeah. So I was doing a lot of kicks and punches and all of that fun stuff. And my shin specifically hurts. And I don't know if it's sore or if it's just like I hit it up against something so many times that it's like a bruise. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I don't see a bruise because where it's sore is underneath my tattoo. Oh. So I don't know if it's going to be like I have this bruise. It's already fading to yellow. I think I showed it to you last week. But that's from catching a shin. So. So your weekends are just filled with violence. No, those are my weekdays. Your weekdays are just filled with violence. And then you get to hang out with me. This is our third Saturday of recording in a row. It really is. We don't normally do that. (laughs) No. We're doing something. Yeah. Something, something. Wink, wink. Wink, 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 wink. (laughs) But not like that. No. (laughs) Shoot. We're recording something special. Yes. Yeah. So, Robin, how's your life? It's, uh, well, okay, here's the thing. I have a bridesmaid's dress alteration appointment this afternoon. In three hours. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Okay. Chop, chop. But, um, unfortunately, I have to wear what I'm going to wear under the dress. So, right now, I'm in a strapless bra, which (gasps) means I'm not doing well. Oh, no. I feel so sorry for you. I've been in a strapless bra this whole time. No wonder you've been off today. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) Yeah, I don't like it, and I look forward to not being in it. Okay. Yeah. Is that your life update? That's my life update, yeah. (laughs) Okay. Well, Robin, I have have a... Something what? Yeah, I have something spooky (laughs) for you. (laughs) So, Robin, even though today for us is September 18th... The most magical day of the year. (laughs) Exactly. I knew that we were recording our first October episode today, and so... I did up my house in Halloween things. Oh, you did it for the record? <laughs> of course. I love it. I, it, it, it is really well done. We have webbing hanging near our heads. Uh-huh. And we, lights everywhere. Lights everywhere. And by far the coolest thing is this fantastic pineapple of skulls you found that we discovered lights up. Yes. I, I did not know it lights up when I bought it, but this is literally my envisioning of our first logo like Mm -hmm. this is what i wanted our pineapple to look like oh okay yeah but i just didn't know how to draw a bunch of many little skulls on a pineapple well it looks really cool it does look really cool i like it a lot you do i like and you oh my god oh my god oh my god hey listen zoe 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 look at the eyes yeah the eyes glow no zoe they're alternating the glowing on that one. It was red blinking at me with, like, okay, my this right eye is lit up red. No, the left eye is lit up red. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's winking at me. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> yes, so it's October for those of 
people listening. Oh, shoot. So I decided that for my something spooky, I'm going to give you a little bit of a Halloween tidbit fact. So let me just say, I love Halloween. I did not know this story. So let me tell you about the origins of jack-o'-lanterns. So it's an Irish myth. And it focuses on Stingy Jack. Who's Stingy Jack? Stingy Jack was a man who apparently was very stingy. No. (laughs) And he apparently also regularly invited the devil out for drinks. So he wanted the devil to pay? So what he did was he went out for drinks with the devil. And he said, you know what, devil? You know what would be really cool? If instead of me having to pay... You turned yourself into a silver coin, and I gave that to the barkeep. And then tonight, when everybody's gone, you can just go turn back to normal, and then we have free drinks. And the that devil does said, sound "Like a good plan." Yes, the devil said, "That's a great plan, Stingy Jack." So the devil did so, and then Stingy Jack took the coin and was like, mm, "I think I'm just gonna hop skip out of here and keep the coin." So he put the coin Which in his pocket. That is the devil. Into his pocket next to a silver cross. So the devil was unable to transform back. And so he walked around with the devil in his pocket for several days. And the devil all the while was like, Stingy Jack, turn me back, you know. (laughs) And um, Jack was like, okay, you know what? I'll set you free if and only if you promise me two things. One... When I set you free, you leave me alone for a year. Don't come for me. And two, when I die, you don't claim my soul. Mm. And the devil said, yes. Okay, I will do that. Okay. So he frees the devil and the devil skadoodles. But he's mad. He's mad that he was tricked. So exactly a year later, he comes back. And he's like, Stingy Jack, I'm here for you. Stingy Jack, I'm back? Stingy Jack, I'm back. Yes. (laughs) And so Jack, knowing that the devil was going to come for him, somehow convinced the devil to climb up a tree to pluck a fruit. So while I don't know how, okay, Okay. I got this from history.com and they did not go into detail about how he convinced the devil to climb a tree. But so the devil climbed the tree and then Jack (laughs) carved a cross into the bark of the tree. And so the devil was trapped in the tree. Could he not fall out? No, because there's a cross. <laughs> Could he not go up? I have no idea, I Robin. really don't know what the devil's abilities so, <laughs> would be in that situation. Me neither. So, Jack said, I will let you down, but you have to promise me one thing. And the des- devil said, what? And Jack said, you have to not bother me for ten years. So you go away and not come back for another ten years. Why don't you just do for the rest of your life? Listen, Jack is drunk, Okay. Okay. <laughs> So, the devil agrees. He crosses off the cross, I guess. I don't know what he does. And the devil leaves him for 10 years. But in that 10-year period, Jack passes away. Okay. So, the devil is unable to claim his soul because he made the promise that he would not claim his soul. But God didn't want somebody as stingy as Stingy Jack or as amoral as him who goes drinking with the devil in heaven. So, God refused to claim his soul as well. So Jack's soul was destined to wander the earth, Mm -hmm. and he became a malevolent spirit. Oh, no, not Stingy Jack. I know. So he was cast to the earth with nothing but a coal to light his way. And so he found a turnip while he was wandering. He carved it out, put the coal into the turnip, and used the turnip as a lantern To light his way. Huh. So now people will find... Originally... Excuse me, ma'am. I'm telling a story. (laughs) But originally, jack-o'-lanterns were carved into turnips and potatoes and, in England, radishes. And so um, people hearing this story around Halloween, which is when he died, they would... Well, you know, in the legend of Halloween, that's when the spirits come back. 
So they carve out turnips, but they put scary faces on them to scare away any malevolent wandering spirits from their house. And so they put those carved out turnips, potatoes, and beets in their front porch area. Mm -hmm. And then when the Irish came over to America, they found a pumpkin. And they're like, these are perfect for carving. They really are. They really are. And so we started carving faces into the pumpkins and these were called jack of the lanterns or jack o lanterns i like that you're welcome so do we not want jack to come no because he's a malevolent spirit okay cool yep so that's what jack o lanterns are they scare away bad wandering spirits i love knowing that you're welcome thank you very much zoe mm-hmm. and like i said that's from history.com okay cool are you ready for my story today Mm, I guess, yeah. Okay. So, in keeping with the Halloween theme, I am not doing anything spooky at all. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) So, but I am going to tell you about a fierce rivalry. A son of European immigrants, a duel, and a shot that changed the political destiny of this area. And no, I'm not telling you about Hamilton. Okay. Okay. I, I really thought that would be, like, more. Wow, I thought that was Hamilton. No, I don't know the story of Hamilton at all. Okay, well, it comes into play in some of my notes, but okay. <laughs> okay. So, I'm telling you the story of uh, William Goebel, born Wilhelm Justus Goebel, but he goes by William. He's the son of German immigrants. He was born on January 4th, 1856, in Carbondale, Pennsylvania. He was born two months early and was a super preemie. He wasn't even three pounds at birth. Ooh. Yeah. But he survived. Okay. Which is kind of surprising. Yeah. What year again? 1856. Yeah. That's very surprising. It's very surprising. But he did survive, and he had three younger siblings, and they were raised mostly by their mom while their dad was in the military. But at the age of, you know, I don't know what age he was. In 1877, and you can do the math. Okay. He graduated law school, and he met up with some fellows. Now, everybody in this story is named William or John. (laughs) (laughs) Just so you know. Okay. And these two fellows were named John G. Carlyle and John W. Stevenson. Now, John W. Stevenson was a Democrat. Okay. And he had some Democrat friends. And he liked William Goebel who I'm going to just call Goebel. And he was like, Goebel, meet my friends. It might come into play later. Okay. 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 I'm nodding. So he actually did an apprenticeship in John W. Stevenson's firm and then worked his way up to partner. So he was trusted, smart, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one defining characteristic of Goebel is that he was super, super wary of railroads and super pro railroad regulations. Okay. And so in his law practice, he would work on behalf of railroad workers and, like, their widows as well. So, So, like, when you say he was wary of them, like, was he saying, like, they, the building practices weren't safe for employees, or? There was a lot of unsafe working conditions going on. Gotcha. And he was trying to battle that. Okay. And he was really it, it's kind of interesting because you know today we're still talking about business regulations but at the time railroads were the big industry business going on so uh he was very pro regulation in that sense okay now he decided to run for the state senate in Kentucky in 1887 because special election because this guy who was originally in the seat was like I want to be lieutenant governor And I'm sure he sounded exactly like that. (laughs) So uh, it was a little bit rocky of an election, and he ended up winning only by 56 points. 56 votes. Points would be completely different. It's like, whoa, you, like, 56% of more people voted for you than the other guy? That's not how it works. No. No, it's not. But uh, so this would not be the last time that William Goebel had a narrow vote margin. Dun, 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 dun. Voter fraud? We're not there yet. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. So a key thing to know 
that Republicans and Democrats in the 1800s or early 1900s were not the same as what we know them to be now. Right. For example, uh, well, today we don't really have railroad legislation as one of the major political points. Yeah. But it was a huge point, again, his main point at the time. Now, Democrats were typically the people who were... um, there was a group to be upset about how the Civil War panned out, it would be the Democrats. Mm-hmm. And they often voted against black people having rights. But Williams Goebbels, I'm calling him Goebel. The family Goebel came from was typically pro rights. Okay. And as a Democrat, even though he was a part of this party, he also did things that were in favor of minorities and women's having rights which was going against his party. And also, I think, was maybe the beginning of some people in the political sphere not liking him so much. Okay. Yeah. Part of the other reason that they didn't like him is because he wasn't exactly the most likable guy. (laughs) Okay. He was a Slytherin. Now I am talking to a Slytherin, so I'm not... Guys, the look she is giving me. Okay. I'm not bashing Slytherins. But I'm saying it's a very particular personality. (laughs) I'm not doing well in this conversation. But, okay, he was a Slytherin. And when you are a Slytherin in a political sphere, Mm -hmm. it can be cutthroat. Right. You can be cutthroat. And he was, like, a little cutthroat. Okay. And he was not great at giving speeches. He was not super good at like meeting people and he really developed like a few close friendships but then other than that he could seem cold to you okay and also he was a little bit scary looking (laughs) actually i'm gonna show you i'm I'm gonna go to his wikipedia page right now and show you the image of him okay what was his date of birth by chance are you gonna do like some horoscope Horoscope. uh january 4th okay so he's a i don't know He's, um... I don't know. The one before Aquarius. Pisces? No, Pisces is after Aquarius. Is it? Yeah. Okay, I don't know. Um, there's so many gobels. This is what he looked like, Zoe. He looks like a dapper young man. He doesn't look a little bit eerie to you? No, he looks like the most normal photo I've seen of an old person. He looks like he's sneering at whoever the place the photographer told him to look at was. I guess he did. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, well, this is going to be, like, our main image for the episode on social media. So, everybody, tell us if you think he looks maybe, like, a little bit creepy. Capricorn, that's what he is. Okay, is that a bad thing? I don't know. I don't. I only know Aquarius, Pisces, Cancer, Leo, and Virgo. Okay, okay. (laughs) Uh, But... Among his, depends on how you look at him, I guess, but among some of his qualities that made him sometimes not super likable to people in general, because, you know, they viewed politics in a certain way, he was crazy smart. And so he was able to maneuver delicate situations. He got things done. Mm -hmm. And it's the opposite of, have you ever seen Wicked? Have you ever heard a song from Wicked? I have heard the... The, the flying song. Have, am I just... I'm obviously referencing too much musical theater for this show because this is not the last reference I have. But, okay, in the song Popular by Glinda... Uh, Which is the witch, right? One of the witches. Wait, the green witch or the good witch? The good witch. Oh, darn, okay. She's trying to help the green witch become popular. You know, I've only listened to a few songs, honestly. <laughs> but I've listened to this one a lot. And so she says, Celebrated heads of state or especially great communicators. Did they have brains or knowledge? Don't make me laugh. They were popular. Uh-huh. This is the opposite of that. Okay. Yeah. He's 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 not popular, but he's, like, effective. Mm-hmm. Now, you know who he reminds me of? And you really won't get this reference. Man, okay, I'm just talking to the Game of Thrones people out there. He reminds <laughs> me of Stannis Baratheon. This guy is Stannis Baratheon. Totally, completely. If you know, you know. If you don't, you don't. Sorry, bye-bye. You know what? I'm just going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so I can just have a one-on-one conversation with the listeners. Yeah. All right. Now. He was only elected to finish out the guy who wanted to become lieutenant governor's term. So Mm -hmm. he had two years in office, but 
did a lot of that two years, particularly with the railroads. He did legislation for the railroads that was good for regulations, and you know what, I really did not get into the weeds of that. Okay. Yeah, but he was elected again in 1889, and he was elected again in 1893, and this time they must have actually really wanted to vote for him. I'm trying to stay away from the word popular, but maybe he was popular with the voters. I don't know, but... Uh, 75% of people voted for him, which okay. is crazy high yeah. in today's standards. Yeah. So, and here, <laughs> he uh-huh. was chosen for to be a delegate for a constitutional convention in Kentucky that was regarding the state constitution specifically. And this one seemed a little bit out of character to me because there were 250 days that you were supposed to be there for the constitution convention. And Zoe, guess how many he was there for? 249. 100. Oh. He was just not feeling it, I'm guessing. Yeah. But he would make sure to put in railroad commission there. And because it was in the Constitution, it was hard to get out of the Constitution. So regulations are here to stay. I think that's what that means. Okay. You know what he didn't make sure was taken out of the Constitution? What? A ban on dueling. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. So they had a ban on dueling on the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah. It's, okay. It comes into play. Okay. All right. Now we enter John Lawrence Sanford. He is one of the guys who doesn't like Goebel. Why he doesn't like Goebel, you ask? Because Goebel did railroad regulations, and one of them was being like, okay, you're going to take off the tolls. You're not going to get money from tolls that you usually get money for. And this guy was, like, losing a lot of money for that. So this guy was like, well, if you're taking my toll money, then I'm going to make sure you don't get to be a big-time judge on the Court of Appeals, which apparently was something Goebel wanted to do. And then Goebel was like, okay, well, if you're going to do that, then I'm going to submit an article to the ledger and call you Gonorrhea John. (laughs) (laughs) Boom. Mic drop. Oh, wow. And so... That happened. And then Goebel did what I always love to do, which is go cash your check and bring your best friends along for, like, the fun of it. Uh-huh. I always bring you when I cash my check. Yes. So we, we regularly we make a go day to out the bank. Of it. Yep. We, we regularly go to the bank together. Yep. We have actually done that once. When did we go to the bank together? I don't know. You had to get something, like, signed or something, and I happened to be with you. And you're like, do you mind if we stop by here real quick? I mean, that checks out, but I I don't personally remember it, but you know what, probably. Okay. So he went to the bank, and they were going to First National Bank. And who was outside First National Bank but... John. John Lawrence Sanford, because everybody is named John or William, and everybody has three names. Yes. (laughs) And he says... Okay, so they're like, hey, how you been? And then John is like, I'm going to shake Goebel's friend's hands. Mm Mm-hmm but I'm going to do it with my left hand, (gasps) which is not the thing you do. No. You don't do that. You don't. Now, why was he doing that with his left hand? Because his right hand was in his pocket. With a gun. With a gun! (laughs) (laughs) Good one. And Goba was like, I think he has a gun in his pocket, so I'm going to put my hand in my pocket where I also have a gun. (laughs) And then John said to Goba, like, did you write the article? calling me gone Aria John. <laughs> and Goebel said, I did. <laughs> it's like the, do you bite your thumb at me, sir? It's like that. Did you call me gone Aria John in the newspaper? <laughs> gone Aria John in the newspaper? And he's like, I did. And then they shoot each other. Okay, cool. And uh, Goebel is unharmed by the bullet, but John, he hit John in the head. John dies in five hours. Ooh. Yeah. And as we discussed, dueling is illegal illegal in the Constitution. So they were like, was this a duel or was this not a duel? And Goebel was like, this and this was Mm self-defense. He shot me, I shot him. And he was saying that John shot him first and witnesses were saying John shot him first. So he got acquitted. Okay. Which does work in his favor because if he hadn't got acquitted, I mean, he would not have been able to continue his political career obviously yeah but i did see in a contemporary newspaper called the evening bulletin that it wasn't it it kind of went with Goebbels' thing of okay well i shot him no he shot me and then i shot him but i'm also wondering like 
is it a little bit weird that you all happen to meet each other, that you and the other guy happen to have guns, and that you drew them at basically the same time, and that your friends were with you? Because I read that, and I'm like, I wonder if it actually was a little bit of a duel. Like, maybe we meet here at this time. And it was just something that they claimed wasn't the case because, well, Goebel was the one who survived. His friends were the ones who were there. Mm -hmm. And he would not have been able to continue his office. Right. But this is me speculating over things that are over 120 years old. Right. Yes. But anyway, I'm curious. Just letting you know. I do think, though, at that point, time period every man who could afford a gun carried a gun around and there's another moment in here when it's like and Gobel happened to have a gun on him <laughs> so I'm thinking you know mm. I, and we, like, and if you happen to run across somebody who you've recently called gonorrhea John in the newspaper I would yeah are you saying you would shoot somebody no no no, 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 no. Gonorrhea John? I would be suspicious of any but like if I like let's say I ran a slander campaign against you Oh. The next time we met up, yeah, I would be very wary of your actions. Well, I wouldn't shoot you. No, but you might punch me or something, or run me give over you with your car. To give you the run me run. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Depends maybe, on maybe, how slanderous I was. Maybe a good roundhouse kick. Mm-hmm. But then again, you are the one of us who is like actively punching people all the time. That is true. Yeah. But I have a secret weapon, and you don't know it. Your car. No, my my left hand. So I'm right-handed. Yes. But my left hand is uber stronger, so I don't think you would have seen it coming. Of course, now you would know to yes. look out for it. Yes. But anyway. So I'll just break your fingers ahead of time. It's fine. But okay, I can tell you when people started being like, "What's this Gobel guy up to? Mm-hmm. What's he got up his thing?" So people were elected, a governor and a president. They were Republicans. Now, the General Assembly in Kentucky was mostly Democrats, and Goebel was a Democrat. And they were thinking that the elections for both the Republican governor and the Republican president were fraudulent. Now, I have no idea if they were fraudulent or not, because I think a lot of time has passed, and probably a lot of the sources are biased, and also I don't know if anybody actually knows. Right. But I will say they called fraud on Basically, every election in this story that didn't go their way. Gotcha. Yes. So it's nothing new, then. It's nothing (laughs) new. (laughs) So they were like, okay, I I really don't understand how this works. So basically, there are county election commissioners who help decide what votes are fraudulent or not fraudulent, I think, maybe. And then they were like, Goebel, you need to make a law that's like we pick the people who pick them. It's all, basically what this did, they were saying that it was for, to, to make sure that it would not be a fraudulent election, but in doing so, they shifted the ability to bias the election toward the Democrats rather than the Republicans. Was that their intention? Possibly. We don't know, but it's literally called Goebbels election law because he did do it. Mm -hmm. And people after that were like, huh, we don't really like that. Right. Okay. Can I read to you my next bullet? Sure. Zoe, what is possibly the most epic track in the second act of Hamilton? Okay. I don't know any of them. Okay. Well, listeners, think to yourself, what is the most epic track in the second act of Hamilton? It features Aaron Burr. FYI. So this is the point. Stop shaking your head at me. This is the point where Goebel starts to think to himself, I've been doing this state senator thing for a while, and I kind of want to do something different. He starts thinking to himself, I want to be in the room where it happens. I do know that phrase. (laughs) Your disappointment (laughs) is just seeping into me. (laughs) So he runs for governor. Uh Uh-huh. And (laughs) before he can make it to the big race where he's running against a Republican, he's got to run in his own house first. Literally. He's jogging. Oh. Just kidding. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) But he is running against two other fellas for the nomination. One is last name Hardin. The other one is last name Stone. There are entirely too many names in this story, so I'm not looking up their first or middle ones, which I'm sure would both be included. 
John and William, I bet. Probably. William Harden and John Stone. Yeah. (laughs) So it really starts going down when they're at the party convention because that is when you choose who the nominee is going to be. It looks like Harden's going to win. But Goebel definitely doesn't want Harden to win because Harden is pro-railroad non-regulation. I know, and he's like, the railroads are my thing. Yeah. So... Goebel and Stone are like, okay, let's meet up in secret. So they decide to get together that they are going to work together to make sure Hardin doesn't get the nomination. And what they're going to do is... Kill Hardin. No. Though I do see how this is a true crime podcast, how you would get to that point. (laughs) No, that's not where that happens. Goebel and Stone are like, okay, we are going to combine forces. Goebel's going to give Stone his votes as long as Goebel gets to choose who is in charge of overseeing the convention. Okay. Or something similar to that. And then afterward, all's was go to stone. Goebel will drop out, and then Goebel gets to choose a lot of the other people who are going to be on the ticket. So he is giving up the ability to be governor, but gaining a lot of power because he's putting those people in these places. Mm. A very Slytherin thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and Hardin is like, oh, shoot, I know that Stone and Goebel are going into this together. I'm going to lose because... They're combining a lot of people. I'm not going to get the votes. I drop out. That changes everything. Yeah, because now it's between the two of them. Now it's between Stone and Goebel. So Goebel is like, I think I know what to do. He makes sure that he gets to choose the guy who's overseeing the commission, which is part of his deal with Stone. But instead of dropping out, he stays in, Uh which shifts everything. So Hardin's like, wait, he's still in? (gasps) I'm, I'm going to be in. I'm going to do this. So, everybody. I thought three, Harden dropped out. Harden had dropped out. Apparently, you can drop back in. Oh, okay. Harden drops back in. Then, the guy who Goebel chose to be in charge of the whole thing is like, okay, so the person with the least amount of votes after this, like, non-binding vote we're all doing is going to be dropped out. So, then it's between two people. And Stone has the least amount of votes. So, then it's between Goebel and Harden. And so... In that situation, there were enough people who wanted whatever Stone and Goebel agreed on that they voted for Goebel, even though he was backstabbing and lying the whole time. So Goebel comes away with the Democratic nomination, and everybody is like, what the hell just happened? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Jeezum. This guy doesn't play. He does not play. Now, it's between him and the other guy. The other guy is named William S. Taylor. And I will refer to him as Taylor. Okay. So, Republicans v. Democrats. Republicans win with 200, no, not that, 2,383 votes. Which, I mean, when you're talking about an entire state, is still a slim majority. Right. Hence the dun-dun-dun-dun from earlier. Okay. Yeah, just thank you. I wanted recognition for that. Okay. So... (laughs) So sorry. sorry, I'm just laughing. So Taylor won and Goebel Taylor lost. Taylor won. Okay. Goebel lost and Goebel was like, that's fine. I'm going to do a concession speech. That's fine. So he goes out, thanks everyone, it's good. We're all good. Except the Democrats who are in charge of the General Assembly are like, but we're not good though. And they're like, mm, we think this was fraudulent. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what they do, they can't really do anything at the moment, but they're like, we need Goebel to ask for a recount. Okay. Which are in his rights. So Goebel's like, okay, I'll ask for a recount. He asks for a recount. Now, I don't know what the actual results of the recount were. I don't know if that was just to buy them time. Uh But buy them time they did because the Democrats are having meetings and disputes and there are arguments over where tension is brewing everywhere. So much so that there could be a civil war within Kentucky. Oh, wow. Because they have two guys who are saying, no, I won, the lev- uh, um, I won the governor's seat. No, I won the governor's seat. Now, Taylor was the one who had the official votes in. So he was inaugurated as acting governor okay. in December 1899. And they were like, we still need to figure some things out. But for right now, we do actually need somebody in charge. Right. So it's Taylor. But there was just so much tension over all of this and a lot of that was coming down on Goebel Mm -hmm. and in fact people were saying that they were going to kill Goebel and they started threatening him oh my god on the morning of January 30th 1900 Goebel is walking with some friends 
into the old state capitol building, Mm -hmm. which is somehow different from the state building. It's important that you know that he's going into the state capitol building. And from the state building, there are shots fired from, it seems, multiple rifles, multiple Mm -hmm. Winchester rifles. And one of them, uh, in particular, goes through his chest and punctures his lung. He was taken to a hotel nearby, and people who supported Goebel were all up in the hotel, and when they couldn't fit in the hotel anymore, they spilled out into the streets. Mm -hmm. And they were very, very upset, like you typically are when, like, these public figures die and or dying. Yeah. He's not dead yet, but it's not (laughs) looking good. He has doctors that are looking out for him, but one... The first one who saw them saw that it went into his lung, and he was like, this is not... He's not going to survive this. Mm -hmm. I have a first-person account to read to you from one of the people who was walking right beside him when he was shot, and this was told by Colonel Jackson to the Mount Vernon Signal for the February 2nd edition. Okay. As I could not walk rapidly, Goebel fell back with me, while Lillard walked about three yards ahead of us through the yard toward the General Assembly building. No conversation occurred between us so far as I can remember. I was on Goebel's right, and he was about two feet ahead of me when the first shot fired. The fountain is in the center of the pavement, about 60 feet in front of the broad steps of the state building. When we were about halfway between the fountain and the steps, I heard the report of a rifle. At almost the same instant, Goebel bent double, groaned harshly, clutched at his right side, fell to his knees. I said, my God, Goebel, they have killed you, which was a little too far away to catch him. I guess they have, he said as he was falling. I'm sorry, I just, <laughs> just imagine, like, I guess they have. Oh, yep, they got me. Yep. He fell to his right and then forward, rolling on his back. I think his right knee struck the pavement first. He raised in a moment as to get up on his elbow when I said, lie still, Goebel, or they might shoot you again, which is good advice. The first shot struck Goebel, and it was first from one of the upper floors of the executive building just east of the General Assembly building to which we were going. The first shot was followed in quick succession by four others, and I heard the bullets hum by me and over the body of Goebel. I am of the opinion that the second shot was fired from a side window while the first was fired from a front window. It is my impression that they were rifle shots. I looked for the shots, trying to locate exactly where they came from. Everybody seemed to keep away except F. Lillard and Representative Owen Cochran. I called out, won't somebody come and help carry Goebel away, when the crowd rushed up. Mr. Lillard was almost in the door ahead of us when the shooting occurred. He turned and came running to Goebel's side, while Owen Cochran came up at the same time. These men and others picked him up and started with him to the hotel. I thought they had killed Goebel instantly when he fell. The blow seemed to stun him, and his eyes were set. I thought he was gone. Isn't that kind of odd? I guess by eyes set, he's saying that his eyes were open and just looking forward. Or closed, I imagine. And I guess that could also be a thing. Yeah. Then Taylor, who was acting governor, did some suspicious things. Oh. He ordered the militia, which, why? Because, you know, that's, I guess, your, like, little standing army that you can have. And then he said the General Assembly needed to have a meeting in a week in a place completely different than where they normally meet. Mm. He was bringing the military power in, as I'm seeing this, and pushing the opponents out. Mm. And it seems like this is a warlike movement. Now, did he do this because he knew, because his rival was shot, it was going to, chaos was going to erupt no matter what? Or did he do this because this was strategic? Right. I don't know. Now, the Democrats got together, still determined to make Goebel their rightful governor. And what they did was, they were like, we're not going to this other place. We're going to the hotel where Goebel is. And so they sneaked in. It was like, okay, I'm going to walk in with you. And then a little bit later, these guys are going to walk in. And somehow, enough of the Democrats from Kentucky are going to secretly enter this building. (laughs) Okay. And have a meeting. And what they did was, they were like, figuring out, I'm putting quotes around, which votes were fraudulent, and they discounted enough of them to make it so Goebel would have won. Okay. Now, again, were the votes fraudulent or not? I can't say for sure. All I'm saying is literally everything is suspicious. Okay. <laughs> okay. So they're doing this in the same hotel. So when they get all of the votes counted, they go up to Goebel's room 
and they swear him in. He is on his deathbed, and they swear him into office. Wow. This is January 31st, the day after he was shot. And just so you know, uh, Taylor was still governor, too, because he had also been sworn in. (laughs) So we had two governors of Kentucky. Okay. And I'm going to give a quote from Oscar from The Office Uh about the amazingness that is dual leadership. Another thing I haven't seen. Another thing. Look, it doesn't take a genius to know that every organization thrives when it has two leaders. Go ahead. Name a country that doesn't have two presidents. A boat that sets sail without two captains. Where would Catholicism be without the popes? End quote. (laughs) All right. So just solid situation all around Uh is what I'm getting at. Now, they wanted him to sign an order. They were like, okay, Goebel, please sign this. Please do this. Please do this thing because you are now governor. And Goebel was like, okay, but I need to know what I'm signing because even though I'm on my deathbed. I care. Right. Okay. So they were like, it's just to uncall the militia. Tell them to go home. And Goebel's like, yeah, okay, I'll sign it. So he signs it. Well, no. He's like, read it to me. And then they read it to him. So he actually knows what it says. Okay, good. He doesn't just take their word for it. Now, unfortunately, this is the only thing Goebel had time to do while he was governor. Because he died three days later. Wow. On February 3rd. And I have to assume that that's probably the least amount of time any Kentucky governor has spent in office. Probably. And he probably never even went to the office. He probably just died in that hotel. Well, I mean, in office is like a... Yeah, I know. In I know. hotel. I, mean, I, I think I was probably... making a joke. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So, but he, he did pass away on February 3rd. And we are going to have a little segment that I created in the Axe Man of New Orleans episode and promptly forgot about. Yes. Lastish, wordsish. Right, that is right. Because we have disputes over what this guy's last words actually are. The first idea and the more poignant one is, tell my friends to be brave, fearless, and loyal to the common people. Side note, like, okay. What if we were still called the common people today? Yeah. Like, I don't think that would fly. No. It just reminds me in Game of Thrones when they call all the people who are not nobility small folk. Yep. Totally like, can okay, relate to that. Okay, small folk, common people. Okay, fine. Thanks. I and, prefer peasants myself. <laughs> I prefer peasants. I, the other option, which I'm really hoping is the case, is, Doc, that was a damned bad oyster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really hoping that was the one. And you know what? I feel like it probably was. Because, I mean, okay, the other one, it sounds like something that his friends could have been like, we want him to go down a hero. We're going to say that this was his last words. But the other one feels like something nobody would actually make up. Right. And I can't help but picture, like, what if it was... (laughs) What if he was actually heal- healing from the sh- gunshot wound and then he was oh, given no. a poisoned oyster or like food poisoning or something and he ate the oyster and it was bad and it that's what he died from. Fi- Who decided to give the governor of Kentucky? Kentucky. It's it not a coastal state. <laughs> it was, they were like, he's dying. You know what he means? An oyster. <laughs> that's probably bad because of poor food health. Yeah. Okay, anyway, <laughs> he's also the only governor who was assassinated in office, which I thought was very interesting because if you think about, like, the act of assassinating someone, the act occurred before, before he, he got was in office, office, but the effects of it occurred After. while he was in office. Yeah. Yeah. Well, while he shared an office, they were their desks were butted up against each other. <laughs> now... As can be expected, when you have a state that is on the brink of civil war and then you kill one of the guys who was, I guess, leading one of the sides, things got a little bit hairy. Yeah. The militia were like, listen, we follow Taylor and Goebel is like the second governor (laughs) and also he's in a hotel like laying down right now so we're we're gonna just stay here okay is what they decided to do and they were like all trying to figure out okay who's actually governor right now <laughs> and the democrats were like okay let Goebbels' lieutenant governor become governor it's like a vice president but for right. the state and taylor was like no i'm governor and we're like okay we're, we're still this is who knows what's going on right now and long story short they had the courts decide, and the Court of Appeals was like, 
Goebbels governor. Okay. And so I was like, okay, well, Goebbels governor. So Taylor is out. Goebbels lieutenant governor, whose name I didn't include because there are already so many <laughs> darn names, was in. And Taylor, who said he was innocent, didn't want to be arrested because he was like, I feel like I'm going to be arrested for mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. because... You know, he was incredibly suspicious, and it just so happens that his main rival was taken out. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. he's like, I'm going to go to Indiana. Okay. And that- then he just stayed in Indiana. Oh, okay. He worked in insurance in Indiana. Okay. That is, and he died in 1928. But he was eventually pardoned by the governor in Kentucky, but he did not go back to Kentucky. Okay. I mean, I probably wouldn't want to go back to Kentucky either. Who knows what would happen to you if you went back to Kentucky. Yeah. And also, it was not the... Uh, it was not what's Goebbels lieutenant governor who pardoned him it was like a guy it was the next republican governor and he pardoned him in 1909 okay now 16 people total were indicted including taylor for the shots on you know Goebel, like mm-hmm. with intent to kill Goebel. but only three ended up being convicted okay and one of them was the secretary of state to taylor ah uh. However, Ooh. there was a lot of bias around. Right. And there were a lot of conflicting stories. And some of these guys were just outright pardoned. Now, were they pardoned by the Republican governor? Were they par- pardoned with merit? We don't know. It's all shaky. So, really, this story is still unsolved. We don't know who fired the killing shot who fired the shots in general. Mm-hmm. Because I didn't see reports of, well, this guy came out of there carrying a gun. Um yeah, it's an unsolved murder, assassination mm-hmm. of a, while not sitting at the time governor, a governor. soon-to-be governor. Yeah. Yeah. But it was ruled an assassination of a governor. because And people consider it that because he was governor and he died. <laughs> and he was killed. And he was killed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> not, I mean, not everything is an assassination of a public figure. <laughs> I mean. This oyster assassinated me. <laughs> I don't know. But that is the story of William Goebel, a go-getter politician uh-huh. who used a lot of political cunning and a lot of political backdealing and got to the office of his desire, though it was only for a short while. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you for that story, Robin. Yeah, my pleasure. I learned a lot about Kentucky, guys. <laughs> and I imagine about con- government in general yeah i mean like every time it said this is how something works and i'm like okay i'll take your word for it i mean i, mean, I feel like i'm fairly knowledgeable about current government but like in the like, old day government it's like in 1899 this was what the rules and i was like okay okay i believe you i believe you <laughs> but yeah that right. is my story all right well thank you yeah yeah thank you mm-hmm all right. Oh, it's my turn to do the thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, subscribe, review, and tell a friend. And sign up for our newsletter. Yes. It comes up. out the last Thursday of every month. Yes, it does. And I, I like to think it's funny. I, th- I think it's funny. I Thank think you. it's funny. Thank you. All right. And if you also want to see Robin's sources for this very political episode. It was a political episode. <laughs> you can go to hauntedhospitality.wordpress.com. Mm-hmm. And you can see her sources and her blog. Mm-hmm. You can also send your own spooky stories to us at hauntedhospitalitypodcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Or if you just want to give us feedback but you don't want to post it anywhere publicly, you can send it to us there too. Because we just want to hear your opinion. <laughs> so it's just like... <laughs> You suck. <laughs> well, I was hoping it would be like more like, you guys have changed my life in a positive way. <laughs> um, if you are on the internet. <laughs> Robin doesn't believe me. No, I believe you. I, I And I believe in you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. I do. Go on with your bit. Okay. If you are on the interwebs, you can find us at Twitter at Haunted House. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Haunted Hospitality. I think we're good on TikTok. Mm -hmm. That's just my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, We would love to see you there. (laughs) All right. Stay Stay spooky. spooky.